All right. Well, with that said, people, I see uh, Keith in the backdrop, and he too looks like he's on the move. Let's bring him in. Keith, sir, how are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you doing, Viva? Good, good. If I'm, if I can tell, are you on the road? I am. Yeah, I'm in a hotel room in Toronto. Uh, we just left Ottawa this morning. Uh, I have an event here tonight. But uh, yeah, as you know, we were in federal court on uh, Premier Peckford's case. Okay, well, I'm not going to waste any time because I know we have a limited amount of time with you and um, we're going to use it well. Uh, okay, I guess summarize for those who don't know, Brian Peckford uh, filed a charter challenge against the uh, vaccine requirements for plane and train. Uh, he did not file a charter challenge of any other uh, measure, as far as I know. That's correct. Uh, and so, you know, who is Premier Peckford, or I still call him Premier, but he was uh, pre Premier of Newfoundland for 10 years. And he, as you know, because you've had him on your program, is a unique, he's a unicorn in that, uh, constitutionally speaking anyway, because he's alive and he's, uh, he's a signatory, a drafter of Canada's Charter of Rights and Freedoms, our uh, significant amendment to the Constitution in the 80s. And um, so he is the last living signatory and drafter of our Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And then when he saw what was happening with COVID restrictions, and particularly the decision of the Trudeau government to restrict millions of Canadians from traveling within our country and leaving our country, um, uh, he decided, well, he was clear that that's a gross violation of Section 6 mobility rights, which are uh, one of our most fundamental rights under the Charter, and I can explain why as we move on. And so he uh, instructed me uh, and the lawyers that I have on my team uh, from the Justice Center for Constitutional Freedoms to bring a, a charter challenge seeking to strike down the law um, on the basis that uh, the requirement to force Canadians to be vaccinated in order for them to exercise their basic charter rights is unconstitutional. And so uh, we, we brought that charter challenge back at the end of January. And uh, as you know, it's been a it's been a journey from there. January, February, March, April, May, June, July. That's a long time to get to. Uh, well, we're going to get to the nature of the hearing yesterday. Um, mm. So because th 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 the, the issue is this, there, there might have been a number of charter violations uh, that could have been invoked. You made a strategic decision to limit it to it, I, I forget which 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 section again, but mobility rights. Um, well, we, we yeah, we to be precise, we we uh, went under Section 7, which is uh, security of the person, forcing you to be jabbed mm -hmm. uh, is a violation of that. Also uh, relates to privacy issues, uh, your private medical information. Uh, and then Section 6, of course, because that's mobility rights. And as well, uh, Section 15, um, uh, which is the rule against discriminating against a group of people in the country and making punitive measures against a, a, a minority uh, or any group of Canadians. So we pled all of those in our pleadings, but obviously the most egregious violation and obvious violation is the Section 6 mobility. What's interesting about Section 6 of the Charter is people will know or have a The internet might be freezing up. Keith, uh, chat, let me know if that's Keith that's freezing up or if it's me. Uh, let's try it again. I think we lost you, but on section six. No problem. I'm back. I'm going to turn off my, oops, no, good. I'm just going to turn off my email so I don't have any incoming. Uh, and I've got no other devices running off the Wi-Fi, but we'll see how this is hotel Wi-Fi, and we all know what that yep. means. I'm, I'm yeah. tethering off my phone because the uh, hotel Wi-Fi was... In, I, even, I, even bought, I even bought the premium package. So um, yeah. for $4.95, I thought, how can I go wrong? But um, uh, so Section 6 is unique. And the reason it's, it's different than the other rights that you have under the Charter is there's the concept of the notwithstanding clause, Section 33, that allows government, federal and provincial, to say, we are going to put in a law that violates charter rights and we know it's going to violate charter rights and our law is going to stand 
because we're invoking the notwithstanding clause. You cannot invoke the notwithstanding clause on section six. The drafters, including the only last living signatory, Brian Peckford, the Honorable Brian Peckford, uh, concluded that mobility in Canada, second largest landmass country in the world, was so such a fundamental right that there should be no circumstance, none, under which a government can restrict Canadians' mobility rights. So that's why we really relied heavily on, on Section 6 in our, our challenge. And uh, now it's been, it's been all, I won't say almost a year, but like nine months or something. What had happened uh, that postponed the, the trial? I mean, not didn't postpone it really, but you had to go through some procedures, some steps. Was there discovery? What had been done in the last eight months since the filing of this uh, charter, uh, charter challenge? Yeah, you, uh, I, I have been unable until recently to share publicly what came out of the evidence gathering phase and particularly the six weeks of cross examinations we conducted over uh, uh, of six weeks of cross examinations of 16 witnesses that the federal government put forward, five of whom were external experts, but 11 of them were the head epidemiologist for the public health agency of Canada. And as I'm listing this, giving this list off, remember what Trudeau and the minister said, we're following the science, we're mm. following the advice of the experts. Oh, this isn't politics, you know, politics of division. This is following the science and the advice of experts. So I got to cross examine Dr. Waddell, head epidemiologist, for the Public Health Agency of Canada. If you look at the organization chart, she's Dr. Tam, two other names than hers, okay? I got to cross-examine Dr. Lorenko. She's the equivalent in Canada with Health Canada, the equivalent of the head of the FDA in the US. Paragraph four of her affidavit says, I am the government official with Health Canada who approved all of the COVID-19 vaccines. So if you look at the authorization, her signature's on it. I got to cross-examine her, okay? Um, I got to cross-examine uh, Jennifer Little, who is the lead of the COVID recovery team uh, at Transport Canada, and a whole bunch of others. And some fascinating yet disturbing things came out of that cross-examination process that I'd like to share now that I'm allowed to. <laughs> I was going to say, like, and this not that you know, like I, 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 we just, I, I, you've never told me anything, uh, but I know things that I know that I are not necessarily public yet. And today's, and, and no one will ever know that I know them. But Keith, now you're here; it's public, and you can disclose these things. D do go into some detail about the fruits of those discoveries of the upper echelons of the medical community in Canada that were offering the guide, the guidance, and what. You know, they in fact knew, did not know, or knew that they did not know when uh, recommending these measures. Got it. Uh, thank you. So let's deal with. Do you want to pick one, or should I pick one? Um, now nah, you go for. You, you know the order better than me, but uh, I, I know okay. I know the quotes that I'm thinking of. You'll, you'll get there though. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to mix it up a bit because some of the I don't know some of this you may not have heard, um, and it probably it will definitely almost be news to most of your listeners, so uh, or viewers. Um, let's do Lorenko. So she's the one, Dr. Lorenko is the head official with, um, um, with Health Canada who approved the vaccines. All right, well, in our pleadings, we referred to the COVID-19 vaccine as an experimental vaccine. And that on its face may seem aggressive, perhaps provocative. I wasn't intent, uh, content with either because that's a mistake. I've been litigating for 27, 28 years now. So, you know, you figure out some stuff in that many years of being a litigator. Um, so I was only prepared to put that in our pleadings and describe the vaccine as experimental if it was clear that it was. And I knew that if I asked Dr. Lorenko in cross-examination, this vaccine's experimental, she's going to say no. So here's what I did. I, um, you're old enough to remember Colombo, right? Oh yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, okay. The, the old TV. One more question, ma'am. You know, when you left the country club, did you leave your purse? And did you say you left your purse in the trunk or the back seat? You know, that kind of stuff. So anyway, I kilometered her a bunch of times, but I what I did was I said, um, um, I went through the list of vaccines that have been approved prior to COVID chronologically. And then I went as far back as I could where she would probably have some understanding or involvement in them. So I started with um, the pneumonia, the first pneumonia vaccine that came out about 12 or 14 years ago. And I, I, I said, like, help me understand the process that you used and the pharmaceutical companies used to satisfy you that this vaccine was safe for general population use. And there's the animal trials. There's another phase. And then they do the um, uh, um, there's there's uh, two phases of human trials. Phase two, there might even be phase three, but in any event, the critical point is that there's there's two critical phases of, of human trials. And so in order to be involved in a human trial of a, a new drug or a new vaccine, you go through an extensive process where you're sat down and explain to you, you're volunteering for this, here's all the potential risks and everything else, right? And people actually, some people get paid to be volunteers, some people just do it because they want to help the advances of, of medicine and science. So I was like, okay, so for the, um, the pneumonia vaccine, you did the animal, you did this, you did the phase one human, yep, you did the phase two human, yep. And it was only after you completed, the pharmaceutical completed the phase two, human study and provided you all the data that you were satisfied and that you approved that for use in the general population. Correct. And all right, now let's use the shingles vaccine. Same thing, animal studies, et cetera, et cetera. You know, there was always these key components and she agreed with each of them. And I went to the new pneumonia one. I found another vaccine, walked her through that. And then I said, did they do animal trials on, vac on the COVID? Yes. Did they do the next phase? Yes. Bottom line is, the phase two human trial is the last phase of the human trial before any other drug has been approved is going on right now with the general population of millions of Canadians. And millions of Canadians were not sat down and explained to them the risks of being guinea pigs in this trial. So she confirmed in her testimony that the final phase that has been used for every other vaccine in Canada was not completed by the pharmaceutical companies for the COVID-19 vaccines and is going on now on the mass population. That was under oath. And of course, the slip out words or the mouse hole she tries to escape through is, oh, we developed a new process and it's called the pathway approval process. And I'm like, okay, nice, that sounds great. But the fact of the matter is, the last phase is going on and you're collecting the data from the general population, right? And she admitted this is, and by the way, there was so much interest in this case um, that the court took the unusual step because they're getting so many requests for the evidence, the affidavits, the transcripts and so on, the, rec the motion records and, and other pleadings that they just finally said, we're putting it up on our website. So if you go to the Federal Court of Canada, go to their homepage, you'll probably see right on the homepage, if, if not, just dig around a little bit, you will see a link and all 15,000 pages of evidence, exhibits, affidavits, cross-examination transcripts are there. Look for Dr. Lorenko, look for the cross-examination uh, volumes, look for my name, start scrolling through and you'll find exactly what I'm talking about. So you can fact check it yourself and you'll find all kinds of other things that are interesting and disturbing. So that was a big one there for Dr. Lorenko for us to get her to confirm that this is a huge experiment that's going on. Did, there was very you know, troubling. You know, go ahead. I would say like it, it, almost tongue in cheek, but you had Obama's video clip where he said at a dinner, well, you know, we basically, uh, what did he say? We basically run clinical trials on billions of people. And from my own perspective, Keith, whenever I referred to it as an experimental vaccine, I just went to the NIH website. This is from January 2021, but this is when it's being administered. Experimental mm -hmm. coronavirus vaccine, highly effective. Because I heard people calling it an experimental vaccine as well. I thought the terminology was rather aggressive. 
Um, but then you go to the website of the NIH, not Canada, and they literally refer to it as an experimental vaccine. And I guess we still haven't gotten to the um, to the final stages of it. But Keith, um, did you get into the government immunizing the pharma companies in Canada? Uh, did you get into that from these from the people you uh, examined? When I tried to ask some of their witnesses about that, they played dumb on me. Oh, I know it's a legal question or or uh, their lawyers, the, the federal government lawyers would intervene and objection. My client's not a lawyer. You're asking a legal question. I'm like, no, it's kind of a policy question, actually. <laughs> it has a legal component to it. Mm -hmm. So they dodged out. She, she, Dr. Lorenko, is, if anybody reviews the transcript, um, you just put up the NIH and I was going to proceed to go after her on a change in recommendations that the NIH had made with respect to administering the vaccine to breastfeeding women. And um, so I started off, you know, you got to lay the foundation. You always walk your, the witness you're crossing into things, you get them moving and then you throw the, you know, you snap the trap. And so I was starting to walk her in and yeah, you start off with really simple, easy questions. You know, like your first one is always, what's your name, right? And what's your qualifications because you get them in a rhythm of answering actually you watch their body language too but anyway so i'm starting to walk her into this line and i said you're familiar with who the N nih is and you know what she said no no like i was like okay we're playing silly bugger here really all right so i was just you kidding me the other thing i asked her and every other government expert uh in-house expert was because at this point, we were the only G7 country. So these cross-examinations were occurring in May and June. Every other G7 country at that point had removed their vaccination requirement for any form of travel, okay? Everyone. And, and virtually none of them ever put one in for domestic travel. There was one country that lifted its in early June. So on June, um, mid-June, the ministers came together and announced that they were ending the requirement to be vaccinated to fly in Canada and to be on a train in Canada. In the first week of June, North Korea lifted its restriction. So they <laughs> even beat us. I kid you not. It's a and, but this is these are restrictions on their own citizens for internal travel, not necessarily yeah. on foreigners for travel. Right. Right. Okay. And 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 that's my point and I'm not being clear I guess is that Canada was unique. The United States never imposed a domestic travel requirement for vaccination. Canada was unique uh, and the G7, um, but even for external. So I'm like, okay, so no other G7 country at this point is requiring people to travel within their country to be vaccinated, to enter their country to be vaccinated or leave other than the United States. And um, so I put to each of the witnesses are you aware of anything that's unique? Um, I said, are human beings situated in Europe and situated in other, in England, different physiologically and from a cell biology point of view than can human beings situated in Canada? No. Okay. Does the virus exist differently? You know, the strain we were concerned about at that time was Omicron differently in those places? No. Is there something fundamentally different and unique about aircraft that are used in Canada relative to these other jurisdictions? No. Like, come on. You know, this was not science. Um, but hold on. But so, Keith, I mean, get. I say we'll get to the punchline at some point, but then you, you have to have asked them, so what was the criteria used for establishing this policy? What did they say? Like, I don't know. They, they would they, they would just say that wasn't my job. We would say, what was the metric? What was the metric or the metrics for invoking it? What are the metrics for 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 relieving it? You know, like for lifting the requirement. They would none of them knew. None of them knew. They would always compartmentalize. They would just say, oh, my job is just to deal with this part of it. And my job is just to deal with this part of it. Right. They'd always do this. I was only involved in the testing stuff because we got to cross-examine the person who was responsible for all the testing programs and what tests they used and the testing requirements. Um, another one that was really uh, controversial was the when I cross-examined Dr. Waddell, who is the lead epidemiologist for the Public Health Agency of Canada. 
and I cross-examined her. I, I noticed in her, so how it works in this type of a legal challenge is you, you make your allegation in a notice of application. So this is not like a normal lawsuit with a statement of claim and a statement of defense. It's a judicial review. It's an expedited process. And so you make your allegation as to what you think the government's done wrong and what you want. We wanted the mandates ended and struck. Um, and then because there's a charter challenge, the government's allowed to put in affidavit evidence to support their decision as to why they made the decision to impose mandates, vaccination mandates on millions of Canadians travelers. And we get to put our affidavits in as well. And then you cross examine under oath uh, the witnesses, and then you p compile all of that evidence along with your legal argument. And then you go and argue it lawyers on their feet without witnesses in the witness box. You rely on the documentary evidence when you're before the court to argue why you should get the remedy that you're seeking. And the government argues why they think their mandate restricting unvaccinated travel is justified. So that's the process. So when I was cross-examining Dr. Waddell, I was going through her affidavit and I was looking at the exhibits and the exhibits were, there was two exhibits where it was a report they prepared and it was recommendations from the Public Health Agency of Canada to Transport Canada on the minimization or mitigation of COVID spread in air travel. Bang on point, right? Two of them. Uh, about six months apart. One was just an update of the, 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 the second was an update of the first. And I noticed that they'd recommended as a mitigation strategy mass, and they recommended as a mitigation strategy, social distancing in the departure and arrival lounge and where possible if the plane wasn't full. And then thirdly, um, uh, they recommend, I'm drawing a mental blank, um, they recommended the testing. Um, but I noticed that they didn't recommend vaccination. And I thought, no, this can't be. So you know the rule, uh, you don't, as a lawyer, you don't ask and cross a question that you don't know the answer to. And it's a pretty solid rule that you follow religiously and there's really good reason for it. But there's the odd instance where you roll the dice. And you know what I said, I'm rolling the dice, man. So I did a long setup to build cover and got a rhythm going. Long setup, long setup, and then I and, and I and I used aggressive questioning patterns. So I was like, I put it to you, that blah 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 blah. Right, I put it to you, blah 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 blah. Correct, like boxing her in. So I had that pattern going. And then I said, I put it to you, that the truth is, that the Public Health Agency of Canada did not recommend to transport Canada the vaccination of air travelers, right? And she said, yes. And I was just like, I could tell my whole team was just like, oh, you know, they thank God they were silent. But, and then I did, um, I did the lawyers. It's, it's, but Keith, that's, that's fascinating also because they don't recommend, it's not part of their mitigating factors or their mitigating behavior. And yet it becomes an aspect of penalizing Canadian citizens afterwards. That which was sure. never recommended um, but wait, there's more. There's more. Okay. There's more. One but wait. Of the things, <laughs> All right. But wait, there's more. Um, one of the things that lawyers will do, and it doesn't work on all witnesses, but it works on a, a sizable percentage, like 30% or more, is after you ask a question, and I'm going to do it in real time because we're in a long format. I'd never do this in a short format interview. But so I put it to you at no time did you recommend vaccinating of air travelers, right? Correct. Then you do what I just did. Nothing. And you know what ends up happening most of the they time? Start, they start they talking. They start talking. <laughs> Giving away all the secrets here. And I, uh, it, it, it especially works. Well, guess when what she when said. They're... Guess what she said. She goes something like, because the scientific literature and evidence wouldn't support it being effective. I'm just mm -hmm. like, wow. So not only did you not recommend it, you've now gone further and said it wouldn't be an ep epidemiologically sound advice. And here it became this hallmark policy of the Trudeau liberals, right? To restrict 6 million Canadians 
6 million Canadians from traveling within their country and leaving their country. The last one I want to highlight, there's a lot we could, but uh, this one's really profound and it's disturbing. And I raised this in court yesterday, specifically. None of the ones I've given so far, yeah, I didn't raise them. Um, uh, when I was in, in federal court yesterday on the mootness application, which we'll get to. Uh, but this one I'm about to share with you, I did. Because every lawyer on just not only my team, but remember there was other applicants. There was uh, Carl Harrison and Sean Rickard, uh, two Brits, expats that had um, done a challenge as well through a highly skilled lawyer, uh, Sam Prisvello. So I was thrilled to work with him. He's an amazing, amazing lawyer. And there were some others as well, other applicants. So anyway, um, what, so Dr. Little, uh, not Dr. Little, she's not a doctor. She's one of the few people who wasn't a doctor. Uh, Jennifer Little is the, with Transport Canada, senior official, kind of works up in the assistant deputy minister, deputy minister suite. And she was the head of the, um, the head of their COVID recovery team, whatever that meant. And before they, when the prime minister started musing about, requiring all Canadians to be vaccinated to travel, they, uh, she put together a slide deck, a PowerPoint presentation for a briefing meeting with the assistant deputy ministers, the deputy minister, and it was suggested that this same PowerPoint presentation was presented to the prime minister's office. And she testified and she, they it blew me away that they actually submitted this as an exhibit. Like, I just like, wow, I, if you guys were going to shred or destroy any document, it was, this was the one to destroy. It had so many incriminating things in it. But the one thing that was so troubling to, to all of us lawyers who read it, it was slide 15. And this, again, you guys can go look it up. It's slide, slide 15. Um, and if somebody wants the specific exhibit number in PDF, I can look at my notes and give it to you because I had to refer to it yesterday. Um, and it was, it was a slide about key policy decisions that needed to be sort of reconsidered and very carefully evaluated. And the last bullet was uh, about what kind of exemptions would be allowed, like under what circumstances would you be allowed to, uh, to travel and being unvaccinated. And the decision was made that the bullet was about whether they were going to allow an exemption for compassionate travel, including travel to funerals um, uh, um, and travel to care for loved ones. And so when I was cross examining her, I said, I want to be really clear about what you were thinking. You know, you you wrote this slide. Is that correct, madam? Yes. And you wrote this bullet. These are your words, right? That's true, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, let's understand then what you meant by these words. And so I went through a whole series of examples. And I said, let's say, for example, there was an adult, a father or a mother, and their adult child was in there in Vancouver. And their adult child, someone in their 30s or 40s, was in Toronto and got in a motorcycle accident or a car accident. And they got the call that their son or daughter was maybe only going to be alive for another day. You knew that by making this decision, those parents would not be able to be at their dying child's side, right? Yes. Did you consider the psychological impact the mental health issues that could arise from that. And I went through all these different real life examples um, of being able, not being able to go to a funeral of, of a loved one. Um, uh, um, I, I said, you know, I talked about, um, you know, my wife's a retired nurse and she, bless her heart, she went and provided care to my parents when they were at different stages dying of cancer and, and out of hospital. Um, I, I, you know, I was like, so um, if some, if a family member were to need to travel across the country to be at the side of a family member or a loved one who's been released from hospital from surgery or cancer care and needed someone to care for them, 
you understood that you would be preventing that from happening, right? Yep. Uh, it was just remarkable. Um, and why that's remarkable has been borne out in this Trudeau must go, you know, mega, mega viral campaign, because I've been reading many of those tweets and I know you have been, as have been many of us. And one of the themes that I've noticed is people talking about how, who they are and what the travel restriction did to them and how they were not able to be at their uh, bedside of their dying father or their dying mother. You know, like you've probably read those. And so the fact that they made that, dis they revisited it to begin with. It wasn't like, oh, geez, we never realized this was going to be an implication of our policy, right? They consciously decided to exclude and prevent compassionate travel. To me, that's just so offensive, probably more, but it's deeply offensive that uh, that's, it's, that's what came out. It's enough. Um, it's it's inhumane and it's unforgivable. You know, people want to see Trudeau in jail. That's probably never going to happen. But it's it's just it's inhumane. It has been inhumane from the beginning. And these are things which, did, touch wood, my grandmother died, the November before all of this. We didn't we didn't experience this firsthand. But I know people who could not get to funerals. I mean, weddings. You're 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 denying people happiness, which is a problem. But you're denying people the ability to grieve the way they should. It's inhumane. Yeah, the, the rock girl says it's, it's, it's you know, and, and on a lighter side, but a critically important side, I think one of the things that we've learned, all of us, going through the lockdowns and the curfews and the, uh, the restrictions of the pandemic, that going to even things like your kids being able to go out of town to a hockey tournament, um, uh, being able to travel for these types of things, families getting together for reunions, being able to go to a graduation, you know, um, a significant accomplishment. Um, these are important things to the fabric of our lives, our development, our social cohesion. Um, they're not frills, you know, like there may be frillish aspects to them, but they're critical. And for the government to consciously, and, and of course the our, our, our irony, which I'm pretty sure I pointed out to her, I think I did, it's obvious if I didn't, is one of the big rationales they were offering as to why we needed to have the, the mandate was because of not, by this point, everybody knew the vaccine wasn't working. It wasn't stopping the transmission and so on, um, was to reduce the strain on health care. Well, if you've got a person who can be discharged but needs a loved one to come look at them and look after them in their condo or their home, and there's no one there to look after them. They got to stay in the hospital system. You know, I'm like, did you factor that in? So it's just, uh, and the other thing that really came out was, it, and it was frustrating for us in real time because the pressure was building in late May and June. And every day in question period, you know, the prime minister and his ministers would stand up relying on the advice of officials, relying on advice of the experts. And then in the morning, we're cross-examining them. And it's like, was it you? Nope, not me. Was it you? Nope, not me. <laughs> was it you? I, I, nope, not me. One, one of the highlights I remember reading once upon a time was, um, well, they said, you know, were there any papers? Did you base did you base this on any actual documentation science? And they said, well, I, I certainly hope we did. But I, they didn't say this as much. They didn't have it. They said, "Did you cons was this based on any research policy, whatever?" And the person said, "As a citizen, I certainly hope so." But uh, and you want to talk irony, Keith? And this is disgusting, sick irony. Was that you know someone in the chat pointing out, as I pointed out now many times, ten thousand people over euthanized in Canada in this very same year when they're shutting down the world, shutting down Canada uh, to save old people. Um, one of the cases that made the news was someone who was so lonely from COVID lockdowns restrictions, she sought and succeeded in getting permission for state sanctioned euthanasia, which some people will call something else. Her family could be with her to euthanize her, but couldn't be with her um, to keep her alive. I, it, they, they, they couldn't give her the companionship necessary to save her life, but they were allowed to be there when the state was putting this woman to death. It's 
I, I, I'm a forgiving person. And I'm, I, 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 I think I passed my line, which really, you know, concerns me for other people. Uh, Cause, but okay. Anyways, with that, with that said, what else, Keith, what are some of the other highlights uh, from the, yeah, how many weeks? One? Do you want a fun one? Oh yeah, please. <laughs> so one of the things that we did, um, we we all know that our prime minister uh, in September of 2021 um, went on a French uh, talk show, television. Oh yeah, and called the unvaccinated, misogynist, racist said they take up space and asked, do we tolerate these people? So we had that video preserved. We had it submitted to a court approved translator who presented an affidavit confirming the translation. You have an advantage, you're bilingual. One of the lines that I keep hearing is, oh, it doesn't mean the same thing in French. Which one, and, de la place? Which, which yeah. sentence? I don't know, but I saw you and Marty on the other day, and I you're both fluently bilingual, and you weren't buying it. <laughs> that it's so sure. somehow less innocuous in French. I almost got the sense it was worse in French. I don't know, but let, let, let uh, me bring it up. And Keith, sure. tell me when to stop because I want. I, I I'm, I'm curious. Okay, so I'm going to press play. Puis on sait, on en connaît tous des gens qui sont en train d'hésiter un petit peu. On va continuer d'essayer de convaincre. Est-ce qu'on les tolère? Mais il y a aussi des gens qui sont farouchement opposés à la vaccination. Ils sont extrémistes. Qui ne croient pas dans la science, qui sont souvent misogynes, qui sont souvent racistes aussi. C'est un, 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 un petit groupe, mais qui prend de la place. Was, Et... that the, was that the section or no? Yeah, well, we're talking about the misogynists and also... Just they, they just kept trying to tell me, oh, it's somehow not as bad in French. And I'm like, <laughs> it's well. even worse. The, this translation says they flex muscle. Il prend de la place means they take up space. <laughs> That's what it means. Et uh, là, okay. il faut faire un choix en tant que leader. Est-ce qu'on les tolère? Est-ce qu'on oui. est qu tolère ces gens-là ou est-ce qu'on dit, ben, voyons, la plupart oui, des gens, parce que 80 it's the do we, To me, the most offensive and dangerous language is the do we tolerate these people? So what we did strategically is I put that in the Honorable Brian A. Peckford's affidavit. That's how we got that evidence before the court, because it's relevant to the argument about discrimination. It's relevant to our jurisdictional arguments as well, that he used, misused this power for an improper purpose and for bad faith, abuse of power. Um, however, what happened was uh, not totally surprisingly, the attorney general lawyers decided that it, it was too dangerous to cross-examine the last founding signatory to the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. So they waived their right to cross-examine him. Wow. Under the federal rules of court, I think they forgot about this rule. I can't remember the rule number. It doesn't matter because it's there. It says if someone pleads an affidavit or presents an affidavit that's adverse to your interest, and you don't cross-examine on it or provide rebuttal evidence, the court is to treat it as an established fact. And it actually goes on to say adverse and in interest, but they didn't need to add that last bit. So it's now, so because we put it in the affidavit of the Honorable Brian Peckford, and because they chose not to cross on him, it's now uncontroverted evidence. So at the end of my first cross-examination of one of the officials, I might have been Dr. Waddell, it doesn't matter, I can't remember because there were so many of them, but I, at the end, I would say, if it was a scientific expert like Dr. Waddell or Dr. Lorenko, because I did it to all of them, I couldn't resist, I would say, um, based on your review of the scientific literature, did you find any evidence to support the proposition that unvaccinated Canadians are misogynists. And the Crown lawyers, the, they <laughs> want it. Objection, that's completely inappropriate and blah, 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 blah. And boy, did I go, I went full on. Like I, it was, it's, it's go time. I was, now is my time. And I said, no, it's absolutely relevant. It's in paragraph five of Premier Peckford's affidavit. You didn't cross on it. You didn't rebut it. Rule X says this is now the uncontroverted evidence before the court, and I'm entitled to cross-examine on it, and I shall do so. And 
it was got to leave in a little more heated than that. That's in the transcript too. You can watch us in battle. And then the, the senior lawyer for the attorney general, they had 12 lawyers on the case or something. The senior one goes, proceed. <laughs> so, so well, then the, I got... The, the answer is going to be obviously no. It's going to be a hard no. No, no, no more than nothing more than that. Do you have any evidence? No. Well, the reason I, there was a legal reason to do it. I mean, it was fun. Like, why, why not? Right. But it was fun in a very serious way. And, and I did say, I now remember, I said, when I was going at it with the head lawyer from the other side, I said, these are, I think my wording is, so I'm going to look it up. Uh, it was something like, these are despicable words. This is despicable language. No leader should ever use these words. And our history has shown when a leader of a country uses words like this, it invariably results in many people dying, often millions. How do we deal with these people? It's remarkable that he wasn't immediately, you know, put out of office when he made that statement. Like if you wanted to hype, do a hypothetical, sit around the campfire exercise three or four years ago and say, think of an expression that a Canadian prime minister could make that would be the most extreme un-Canadian thing to say. That one would rank, man, because, you know, we're about diversity and, and acceptance and, 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 and recognition and inclusion. And here he made the most offensive statement. So I put it to each of the witnesses and the legal reason for doing it was, you know, a priori, maybe there is some science that says, I don't know, maybe there was a sociological study that did that found a correlation between those people who are unvaccinated. In other words, there'd be some justification for the prime minister saying well, that. Keith, I mean, the ultimate kick in the teeth irony is that a, a great many people who didn't want to get vaccinated were women because of things that they said were not the case at the beginning. It won't affect your period. It won't affect your menstrual cycle. Uh, it, it's safe for pregnant and breastfeeding women, except for the study from the UK. Sorry, the directives from the UK government that says we cannot recommend this to pregnant and breastfeeding mothers. The, a great many of the people who, did, who were statistically under-vaccinated, women, and ethnic minorities, and yet those are the racists and the misogynists. It's like not only was there no, st there's no study. It's it's actually the exact opposite way around. The people who were reluctant to get vaccinated were ethnic minorities and women more often than not. Yeah, yeah, and and, and you know, and as we know, there's studies have come out and explained why. Because there's in Aboriginal communities, there's a distrust of government. Well, imagine that, you imagine know, like that. of course there is, and same with the ethnic minority. So. So yeah, it's so spectacular, but that was one of the other, you know, interesting moments. And I guess the fun, the important part for me was to be able to wag my finger at these senior lawyers defending the conduct of this prime minister and point out on the record how completely despicable it is, it was and continues to be. So now you, you do, uh, you know, however many weeks of depositions, discoveries, examinations, whatever we would call them, uh, but the hearing yesterday, was not on the substance. This was a, a hearing for mootness because now that now that Trudeau has announced allegedly that these measures are going to be suspended uh, as of what September thirtieth. That it no, should it be. No, was, it was June nineteenth, June fourteenth. I'm just actually looking at my notes here from court. It was June fourteenth. I just snickered because there's something else I got to tell you that happened. Well, this will feed in well because it happened yesterday. Um, so on June fourteenth. There was a press conference where a number of the ministers spoke, the Minister of Health, the Minister of Transport, the head of the Treasury Board, the Minister of Public Safety, the Minister of, I don't know how they've come up with so many ministries. The federal government has very limited jurisdiction in our country, but that's another issue. Anyhow, a lot of ministers, and they held this live press conference. And I was watching it live on one screen in my office. If you've ever looked at a picture of my office, you'll see I have 12 screens. And while I was monitoring, because another lawyer was conducting the cross on some particular witness at that point, and I was watching it in real time, and um, they announced that they were suspending the requirements effective June 20th, that you would no longer be required to be vaccinated to get on a plane or train in Canada. Um, and so um, at the end of the day, we usually would excuse the witnesses these were all done by zoom uh and we would excuse the court reporter 
and the lawyers would talk. And um, um, the senior counsel came on and said, you may not have been aware because you've been in cross, but the federal government's just made an announcement and that on the 20th, we're gonna suspend. And um, she said, we have instructions to offer that a discontinuance on a without cost basis. In other words, I, I, I have instructions to go F yourselves. I mean, th this is uh, for people who don't understand what's going on here. They implement the measures. They force someone to take a lawsuit, to go through weeks of deposition. These are, and they're paying for their own bills while the government is paying for their bills with our taxpayer dollars. Then they say, we've suspended the policy. Your lawsuits moot. We'll let you, we'll let you withdraw without costs or whatever. Costs are, 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 are nothing in any event. Uh, it's 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 a it's more than insult to injury because we've already had the insult to injury. This is a kick in the groin once you're already on the ground. Oh, we, we've 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 abandoned the policy which was unscientific, discriminatory, and inhumane. We'll let you take your lawsuit away. Uh, what what was your response, Keith? Well, and they said so. We we still had another um, about four or five days. We had the balance of the week. And then a couple of days the following week to finish up all of the six weeks of cross-examination. So they said, we're going to cancel the cross-examination for tomorrow. We said, no. These, these cross-examinations are scheduled pursuant to an order from a case management judge of the federal court. We will be here tomorrow morning at you know 8 o'clock uh, mountain time, uh, 8 a.m., to conduct a cross-examination and you better present your witness. If you want to vary that, you're going to have to get a court order because we're, no, you're going to be here. No. And I said, um, I will seek instructions, but I anticipate them being a flat no. So I then phoned uh, the Honorable Brian Peckford, former Premier Peckford, and I laid out to him the circumstances and the proposal. And he, the, you know, like, you, you know, fold your tent and they won't see court costs against you and go away. And he started laughing and he kept laughing <laughs> like, yeah, you think it's that's all it takes to make me go away and fight for charter rights? No. And he was laughing and, and just laughing that he, I could see him kind of gearing it out as to what they must have been thinking. And then I said, Mr. Premier, I said, I think I know what your instructions are, but I actually need an English word. <laughs> Can you either say yes or no? And he said, no. And in other words, no, don't accept it. So we proceeded. And then they said, all right, well, if you guys aren't going away, we're going to bring a, mo uh, a mootness. Uh, we're going to bring an application to strike down your case, strike it out, end it summarily on the basis that it's moot that there's no longer a live issue that needs to be tried, that it's hypothetical and so on. And we said, bring it on. So they brought their mootness application. In the meantime, we made them do all the work they had to do to bring that uh, and file all the paperwork. And then uh, we completed all of the affidavits or sorry, we completed all the cross examinations. Then we wrote our factum. So our big legal uh, argument where we summarize all the facts, the key evidence, apply it, lay out the legal principles, apply the facts to the law and argue what the result should be, which is this is unconstitutional, violates the charter and should be struck. So we've done all the heavy lifting and it was heavy, heavy, hard, hard legal work, intensive with a large team of lawyers that worked tirelessly in paralegals as well. And we got that done in uh, over the summer. In the meantime, uh, we had this this week scheduled that we're in right now. So today's September 22nd, uh, just yep, yeah, uh, for the five day hearing where we were going to originally hear the case in its totality. So what the court said is, here's what we're going to do. We're going to schedule the Wednesday, the, 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 uh, the 21st as a day for the mootness motion. And then we'll get we'll have the full case occur. October 31st, Monday, through to the to completing the first week of November, those five days, to hear the merits case if the mootness motion is lost. So yesterday was the mootness hearing in front of the federal court as where the federal government lawyers stood forward and said, nothing to see here, folks. It's all over. The, What's the, um, man the mandate's no longer in place. Therefore, it's moot. 
there's no reason to go ahead and rule on whether or not this was a violation of six million Canadians' charter rights. I mean, it's so outlandish on its face. And I don't know if there's any uh, you know, nominal damages or damages being requested. I forget in the lawsuit itself, but it, you've had the same judge um, from beginning to end, right? This is one judge assigned to the file? Uh, yes, on case management. No, yesterday was a very senior judge uh, with the federal court. First time we had this judge. Wow. So Which to me is the problem. Way to it, it would have been okay, okay either way, but this was, this was, um, it's um it's a more neutral and 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 objective way to do to deal with this major motion such because it has an existential effect potentially to the litigation to bring in a fresh judge so that's what they did okay that's interesting because you know some people in the states you know you, you get one lawyer assigned to a file so every incidental motion you have goes before a judge who knows mm -hmm. the file in quebec yep. canada's totally different like you know whoever whoever's doing the circuit that day so you got to apprise them of the file what was your impression? Because I, mean, I cannot get out of my own skin on this one. I would be livid if the government thinks that they can, you know, play that whack-a-mole game. Oh, it's no longer now moot academic without without object. And if we decide to re-implement it in two months from now, uh, well, too bad we didn't get that ruling that we were looking for. What, what do you think? The older judge, I think, is going to have less patience patience for this bullshit. Was it a um, was it a tr who appointed the judge? If I may ask, or if you know. I think actually I'm not certain of this because I I don't know if I'm different why I take a different approach than most lawyers but I I don't usually care who the judge is uh, because it's what I do with them and what they do with me when I'm before them I look into their eyes and I look at their body language and I try and communicate with them and I try and see what they're responding to and what reacts to them what bothers them what they like what shocks them you know that kind of stuff so I don't care because, you know, you know, you never know what you're going to get. Right. So but my my belief is that this judge was actually a, a Harper appointee. Um, so but let's just so so we were in court yesterday. In advance, we file our motion argument. So we filed a comprehensive argument in August um, in opposition and set out all the legal and factual reasons why we feel that this is an important case to proceed to its full determination. And one of the things that we relied on, myself and the other lawyers, there was four of us lawyers who argued the case yesterday, me on behalf of Peckford and, and the other applicants that the Justice Center represents there, and then Sam Prevelis for Mr. Harrison and Mr. Ricard, um, et cetera, uh, is when that press conference occurred on June 14th, each minister said, this mandate to require Canadians to be vaccinated to travel is only suspended. Mm -hmm. The Minister of Health said, we will not hesitate to bring it back in the fall. The official press release uses the word, starts off, the headline is suspension of travel vaccine mandate. The first word is suspension. The word suspend or its derivations appears seven times in a page and a half press release suspend okay so um so what the lawyers for the crown argued is i'll read it this is this this is from the actual i get it's reversed this is the actual you can see all my little crib notes from trial um Paragraph 41. So this is what the attorney general's lawyers said to the court about these public statements of honorable ministers of the crown who are members of the governor general council, which is cabinet. Okay. This is what Canadians are supposed to think of these people. This is their representation, the government's lawyers representations to the courts. Um, and in this sentence, applicants is me and Peckford. Although the applicants may place undue focus on the semantics used during the political press conferences announcing the vaccine mandates were being suspended, this is not a legal characterization. It's public messaging. I was like, 
what? So what I emphasized before the judge yesterday is like I just did a minute ago. These are ministers of the crown. These are the people who have the lawmaking function, the executive powers to issue these orders with the signature of their ministerial title. And I said to the judge, my friends, and just for those of you who watch legal proceedings, they're like, why does that lawyer keep bragging about the fact that that guy opposite's his friend? Like, I don't care they golf together. Why does he keep saying that? It's a requirement. They're not my friends usually. Often I don't <laughs> like them at all. People don't I heard, I heard Karimji saying it over and over again yeah. when prosecuting Tamara Lish. My friend over there. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's court protocol. They ain't friends and they know. Yeah, so, so, uh, so we say my friend. Oh, and just by the way, I got roasted on Twitter last night. There's like, oh, Wilson's a masker. Oh, guys, I hate masks. Like I was walking through an airport today and I had no masks on and people would come up. You have to put a mask on. I just smile and nod like I was Russian or something and just kept walking. But I had to wear the mask when I wasn't on my feet. So I had to walk up to the podium with a mask on and it was live streamed to 4,000 people. So it's like, oh, Wilson's a masker. I'm not a masker. And the other lawyers are not my friends. Okay, just to clear the record here. And just as a little interesting legal trivia, I have those funny initials behind my name, which I notice I now have to change. Uh, QC, uh, Queen's Council, now King's oh, Council. So someone asked that in the chat. They said, I'm not joking. Does he have to change it to KC? And now I understand. Yeah, I do. Um, yeah, it's KC. And, and I'm di digressing, but... My, my youngest said to me, 17, I love these guys that keep you so humble. He says, Dad, kind of sounds like KFC. And I said, well, it could be worse. If you were older, you would have, you'd have you maybe be thinking like KC and the Sunshine Band. <laughs> so I guess yeah, we'll have to be happy. But the, Jeez, the, the, tradition is, the tradition is when I'm speaking and the lawyer goes to refer to me, they're not supposed to call me their friend. They're supposed to call me their learned friend because I have a KC. Um, anyway, I don't make them do that. That's fine. Uh, so th th that's a little trivia. But what I said to the court was, the judge, is I said, you know, my friend from the Attorney General is trying to suggest to you, and I guess to Canadians, that when me honorable ministers of the Crown make public statements at official press conferences, we're to humor them and we're not to treat them as serious and we're not to treat them as representations that we can rely on. Outrageous. You know, it was really tone deaf that they would sort of throw their ministers under the bus to say. So why it was relevant is a case can be moot if it's about things that are now settled and in the past, right? Uh, that's one of the criteria. And our whole point was, it's only suspended. And they've said over and over again, repeatedly, each of these ministers, that they won't hesitate to bring it back. They use the word suspend or suspension or its derivation seven times. The, press, the, the, the official press release leads with the word suspend, suspension. So uh, that was one of our arguments, is that this, is, this, this could come back. So and then it's a technical argument, but the higher level argument um uh the, the uh, one of the other arguments they made was and this was interesting because it seemed to be working and i think i deconstructed it it was this idea that well if they do come back your honor they said it'll be based on different facts and you know, the exhaustive and comprehensive review process that the minister uses to bring in, implement these rules will be reestablished and it'll be, so I call BS on that. Like I pointed to the documents that were the source of this and it was a ministerial briefing note. Oh, well, there, Keith, just <laughs> look at here. COVID boarding flights and trains in Canada. The, vac the vaccination requirements are suspended. Suspended, right. Not, not, not repealed, not revoked, not ended, not, 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 not declared unconstitutional by a court, suspended. suspended. No harm, no right. foul. Go on with your lives, right. you peasants. Yeah. And so um, uh, I made the argument, uh, this is a little bit 
complex, but I think I can probably do it. I was able to do it yesterday. And it's this, I said, okay, you know, my friend is emphasizing that there's no jurisprudential um, value. There's no, this isn't going to contribute to the jurisprudence. It's not going to contribute to the case law. It's not going to have any value because it's based on something from the past and the facts may be different in the future. And so I kind of did the clear, let's clear the table for a minute, you know, your honor, and let's think about this. How does our common law system of justice and, and law work? Well, it's based on the, unlike the civil code that you have in Quebec, the common law system, the British common law system is based on the principle of stare decisis, precedent, right? So like cases should be decided alike. Past similar decisions should inform the court in the decision they make on a future case. So I said, what do we do? So I said, is it a matter of precision? I said, Your Honor, is it a matter of precision? Because my friends keep are suggesting that maybe it is. It's a matter of precision. I said, it's clearly not. Because when do you ever get two cases that are precisely the same? At a minimum, the names are going to be different and the dates are going to be different, even if they both involve a black Dodge truck and a transmission that didn't work, right? Like, Cases are never perfectly the same. So what we do as lawyers is we look for similar cases. And I said, Your Honor, you, you will have had lawyers before you with, with enthusiasm say to you, Your Honor, this case here is on all fours with my case before you. And she kind of smirked and nodded her head. Yeah, like I've heard that before. And or you'll hear us lawyers say, this case is on point, Your Honor, right? Or we'll say, as you've heard already a number of times today, this case is distinguishable. It's different. So I said, in fact, the law is about the art of nuance. It's about the art of nuance. It's the art of subtlety. And we look to the elements of a past case and we say, how many of them are similar to the present case? And then we try and fit them together to convince you that you should follow the precedent of that other case. The key point is it's not about precision. It's not about black and white, and it's not about it lining up perfectly. And the most common thing about this mandate is the restriction on travel. The oh. variable, the variable has been the degrees of variance of the virus. So there's more than enough here that if you rule on, if, if we have the full trial, and there's a determination made on whether what the government did, it will provide value. It will provide value to the courts. It will provide value to the litigants. And it will provide value to millions of Canadians who need to understand um, whether, their charter, whether their charter rights were violated. Well, I mean, and Keith, it's just logically. I mean, yes, no two cases are ever the same, but precedent serves as an indication for future cases. If the court comes out here and says... It was unconstitutional because there was an absence of scientific justification. If you're going to violate this charter right, which is one of the ones that is not subject to the notwithstanding clause, here are the criteria. Let's let's set out an Oaks test for the violation of Section 6 so that they can apply that in the future to any future lifting of the suspension or re-implementation. That's how it works. It's a terrible argument. I mean, it's just it's terrible on its face from the government. And the, the second thing, Keith, am I not wrong, though? If the court comes to the conclusion that there was a charter violation, well, it, it does open the door for damages or not, or, or some nominal damages? Well, we, didn't plead, we didn't plead damages, but it wouldn't, uh, we could come back, as could all Canadians, right? And 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 all kinds of people. Uh, yes, the short answer is yes. There's consequent, there's legal, broader legal consequences to such a ruling, as there should be. <laughs> it shouldn't be consequence free. So the law is supposed to have a consequence when you don't follow it. But let me talk about a couple of other really important things that happened yesterday that get to the nub of things that are at the core of what bothers so many of us about what's been happening in our country. Is um, I talked about the role of the courts and the role of the charter. And there was a moment that I made a statement, and I'm not going to be able to repeat it here because it was so complex in how I did it. I can't even remember how I did it. 
but I had to get a concept across that was super sensitive without saying it. And I did, because I watched how the judge reacted to me. But, and I'll try, I might be able to do it. Um, and I'm really tired just so you know, but I'm gonna try. Um, I, um, I talked about the elements of living in a civil society and the importance of the rule of law. And that how in a civil society we resolve, actually I can do it, how we resolve disputes peacefully is through the courts, through engaging lawyers, and having courts rule on important issues that are in dispute. And what happens if we block that institution? Or if that institution isn't available to Canadians to have that adjudication made, what options does that leave Canadians? Right? It was when I used the word in explaining this, I did it in a slightly different order, and I used the word peaceful. I noticed the judge kind of like, ooh, yeah. Like, what else is there, guys? And that's got to be avoided at every and all cost, always. You, you didn't you didn't you didn't pull a Trudeau and say, do we tolerate these politicians? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, what I did say, you know, the the sleight of hand of the uh, the sleight of hand or the skill of the lawyers from the attorney general was they talked about the mandate to be vaccinated to travel as being legislation. And I said, Your Honor, let's be clear. That is not an accurate description. The Aeronautics Act is legislation that they used. Section 6.41 of the Act is legislation that they used. But that section was enacted decades ago and not for the purposes of this pandemic. So I said, when my friend uses the term legislation, we immediately imagine, you know, introductory bill, you know, first reading, second reading, third reading, over to the Senate, blah, 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 royal assent, the proclamation becomes law. And the, it's open debate uh, before the open parliament with opposition parties, the public watching and everything. That's not what happened. This wasn't an act of the legislative branch. Uh, it wasn't an act of the... Um, um, of the judicial branch, right? It was an act of the executive branch. This was a ministerial order. It's a piece of paper the minister signed. It wasn't even a cabinet order. He didn't even have to convince his cabinet colleagues. The minister of transportation merely signed an order. It was an executive order that stripped over 6 million Canadians of their fundamental right of mobility and prevented them from being at the sides of uh, the bedside of dying loved ones, etc. You're making you're making me angry, Keith. You're, what you're saying now is people don't really appreciate it. I mean, I think they called it, it an a, order in council. Order. It was a, it's, in, it's, it's an order in, but it's a it's an it's a ministerial government speak. It's yeah. a minister, it's a ministerial OC. It's a ministerial order. It's, 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 no, it's an MO. It's not even MOC. It's an MO. It's a ministerial order. So, in fact, the minister could have his deputy sign it. And the one that's still in force requiring the Rive Can app and all that stuff is signed by the deputy. It's not even signed by the minister. So, um, this whole notion that there is some, you know, legislative process going on here is bunk. And I pointed to it and they didn't try and touch it in their redirect or their reply because it was obvious that I'd killed that one, that point, driven that point home. So it's the ease with which they can bring it in, the absence of a check and balance. So then I talked about, I closed at a very high level. I wish I could remember what I did, um, but I can't because I was so focused on reading the judge and trying to relate with her, um, is that I talked about the three-legged stool falling over um, the, and, and the three elements of a democracy in a civil society, the separation of powers, the three elements being the legislative branch, the executive branch, and the judicial branch. And we need all three to have a safe, functioning, healthy democracy, civil society. And if the millions of Canadians who have been harmed by this policy 
by this ministerial order, this executive action, don't have access to the courts, we risk the stool falling over. I, I you, that, you, you really did just piss me off with that because people don't people say, well, it's the law. None of this went through the legislative process. It didn't go through public speech and debate. It didn't go through evidentiary hearings. It didn't go through readings. It didn't go through the somber, no, the sober afterthought of the Senate. Some <laughs> yeah. dictator, some dictator sitting at his front, sitting at his desk said, I think we'll um we'll require vaccination or 14 day quarantines for people entering Canada. Yeah, let's do that. And it, it, with with the same degree of ease and the same lack of oversight, that Trudeau, you know, maybe even less than when he signed that order in council banning 1,500 firearms. I think I think this model will just shelve right now. I think these Canadians they'll stay they'll stay home or they'll go to 14 day quarantines when they come back. Stroke of a pen, no science, no nothing, evidenced by the fact that the people you deposed didn't have one iota of a good answer for the crap that they someone else authorized. Um, how long until you get a decision? Well, I got to throw one more in there and I uh, apologize please. for making you angry, but it's important that this truth come out, right? Um, is not only were, was it the case, all of the things you just said and that I've explained earlier about how this came to be, is that if you look at um, uh, exhibits, I'll find it here, but if you look at a couple of the exhibits from uh, Little, you, you, you'll um, send me the link for this afterwards, Keith. Uh, I tried looking yeah, for it, I can't sure. find it too quickly. I'll, po I'll post the link. And people, bear in mind, it's going to be a link to the court site, so you're going to have to go through all of the individual exhibits. It's not going to be individual exhibit links, but I'll get it up. Yeah, and it, it, it'll be laid out pretty good. They've got a pretty good database in there, and it's a lot of documents. But the go go to Jennifer Little's affidavit. That's the, the, the Little, Waddell, and Lorenko. Are, are, are really rich territory. Um, uh, at least the transcripts are for sure uh, more than, but, but Little's, Jennifer Little's um, affidavit and its exhibits are spectacular in a very terrible way. Because when you piece the timeline together, it became pretty clear that the prime minister decided, you know, maybe with Gerald Butt's help, that the way forward was, you know, the politics of division. Get Canadians fighting amongst themselves so they don't know the fail don't don't notice the failings and the incompetency on a gross scale of the Trudeau Liberals and their cabinet ministers, which I call equivalent to a high school council, but I they probably function better than these guys even do. Um, but what what's in there is you can see this almost panic between the deputy and assistant deputy minister and other key officials, where they're saying, you know, we got to get this new mandate in place, like. Obviously, Trudeau's told them to make it happen and they don't have a rationale for it. And they even say, like, we need to come up with a rationale really quickly. Read their emails and why they put those in. I'm still astounded. I'm glad they did. Thank goodness. But um, they they were struggling. This was a political decision by the PMO's office to divide Canadians as a political survival strategy for a very unpopular prime minister and and uh millions of canadians were tormented and harmed by his manipulative uh aspirations so fascinating in in a disturbing way the evidence that's come out so we made the pitch that this kate we're ready to go we have done all of the extremely hard work our compendium of evidence is fifteen thousand pages I kid you not. And it was What's sitting that? beside the judge. It's so large. We prepared it. My team at the Justice Center, incredible paralegals. They work day and night, literally day and night. We got a request last week that due to short staff shortages at the federal court, they don't have the capability of printing it. Could we produce two copies? So paralegals worked through the weekend, day and night, and we had them couriered and they arrived and they were sitting up beside the judge so tall that it was like almost as tall as her. It was symbolic. And so well, I said, the, all the work's been I, done. All we have oh, to no, do, was, go ahead. Sorry, go, I, no, I was gonna say, all the work's been done. 
all that has to be done now is have a judge hear it and render a decision. That exactly. might scare a judge off. No, a judge might say, geez, I don't want to go through this. I don't want to make a decision based on this. Well, they don't have to read it. It's, it's moot. It's moot. Changes. Right? Yeah, no, I get yeah. it. It would be scary. I would be scared if I was a judge. But as you know how it works is they don't have to read all 15,000 pages. We tell them which pages are important and we want them to look at, right? So there might be something that's 200 pages long, a transcript, and there might only be two pages in there that was important evidence, right? It, we have to disclose everything. So um, anyhow, um, so the, the real important pitch we made was that um, uh, that all the heavy lifting's been done. This is this case is unprecedented in terms of its scale of charter breach. Unprecedented, and the courts have a critical role in our democracy. They're there to, as a check and balance, the overreach for legislative action and executive action. It's in the public interest. It will undermine the confidence in the institutions of our democracy if this case does not get heard, and we urge the court to hear it. Um, uh, other counsel made incredible, both very highly technical and accurate legal arguments on the case law. Uh, Sam Perez-Velas did a terrific job on that, as did other counsel, uh, Samuel Beauchamp and uh, Nabil Nehem. I just mispronounced his last name, but he'll probably forgive me and make me buy him a beer, uh, which I will do. Um, uh, but Nabil did a phenomenally emotional job. Like he, he self, he's a lawyer, but he was self-represented. So he talked to, and he was an immigrant and he lived in countries. He mentioned, mentioned Palestine and uh, other places where he was not able to leave and how he never thought when he came to Canada, he would find himself in that same situation. And he talked about the breakdown of the social contract and other incredibly moving points. So we're hoping that the court will rule that it is not moot, that it is in the public interest for us to proceed on the 31st of October for a full hearing. Um, I'm about 50-50 right now. The court may just say, nah, um, Come back, want. come back, come back if they reinstate this. Come back if well, they lift the suspension. You got to start over again. I know. You know, you, Keith, you, 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 don't, you don't need to convince me. I, I'm enraged because it's it's a it's a cheap tactic. It doesn't even it doesn't even fit the grounds for mootness because one of the one of the exceptions to mootness is if there's a risk of recurrence, and it's it's an obvious risk of recurrence. But it, it's the idea that they can play this game, force private citizens. To go through the to go through all of this, and when I said you know the court costs would be minimal, I, I you know I sort of didn't appreciate a month of depositions. That's like at least a thousand, two thousand bucks a day, uh, copies, stenographer, and whatever. So the court Way costs are going to be yeah. yeah. Um, it, it's it's offensive on its face. If it gets dismissed for mootness, uh, that'll be a black pill for me. If it gets authorized to go to trial. Okay, no black pill, no white pill. If it gets dismissed on the merits, black pill. So we've got two roads to a black pill here, only one to a white pill. And by the way, someone had asked if CBC Global News is going to cover this. I I, I was Googling. Uh, I was trying to see. Nobody covered this from yesterday that I saw. But Nothing. Nothing. Zip didn't happen. You know, there's nothing to see here. It, it, you know, it only affected 6 million Canadians. I mean, you know. Yeah, so they, they, they want to defund amazing. the CBC anyhow. So. Exactly. I have done far lesser cases many times where I have come out of the courthouse to the gaggle of reporters and all the guys with their big TV cameras and the microphones coming out and getting the huddle and Mr. Wilson this and Mr. Wilson that. Not a single one. And 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 nothing. Zero news coverage. It's like Premier Peckford doesn't exist. It's like this case doesn't exist. If it, the, 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 I, I've done some interviews lately. Uh, some of it because of the public inquiry for the freedom truckers who I'm representing and have to go back to Ottawa for, for seven weeks. And we can talk about that in another program. Um, and we should, but um, you know, it's so absolutely. Oh, I was, what I was going to say, I've spent like two hours with a reporter on an interview and I know they wrote a story and it got to the editorial desk. It's like, Nope, that will piss off our paymaster. We're not doing that story. 
The media is so extremely controlled right now by their desperation for money, and it's it's they're in a, they're in a death spiral because, you know, more and more people are tuning out and not paying for it because they see it's propaganda. So they become more desperate for the money, the only money they're getting. We know Global News said they're on their you know went bent knee to the government here last week and said they're they're in their last gasp of financial health, of life. And so they don't dare say anything negative about the government. We're in a dark, this is dangerous stuff. Well, luckily I'm not dependent on the government for any subsidies. I've just, I, I'm dependent on the government not to shut me down. I mean, that, that's the one thing. So long as I can continue to, you know, succeed on my own merits. You're not in Canada anymore. I, well, I, I'm not in Canada. Now. It, things look like they might be turning around, but People are asking. I'm. I'm not. I'm not a. I'm not a citizen here yet. I'm still a Canadian citizen. I'm here on a visa. Yeah. And it, it, it has a finite time frame. My plan is not to. I, we had an opportunity here with Rumble, and it's it's working out. Rumble is the free speech platform. But uh, yeah, don't expect CBC, CTV News to cover this. And when Justin Trudeau makes the joke, you know, six hundred million dollars can buy you some some good headlines. Uh, it can also buy you some no headlines. Oh man, Keith. Okay, so. We will do a follow up on the truckers convoy, um, and I know you had a, an out at five thirty. Um, what uh, you got to everything you wanted to mention, right? Yeah, I think I misspoke earlier in my fatigue. It was the phase three trial that they hadn't completed. I think I said phase two on why it's experimental the uh, vaccine. It's the phase three that is being completed on millions of people. If someone writes, "Oh, Wilson got that wrong," yeah, I did. I, yeah, I meant to say yeah, phase we, three. We, we, uh, but it was the made. last phase that hasn't been completed. And I just, it would bother me if I didn't correct myself on that. I would make my emphasize that while I'm working for phenomenally reduced hourly rates, as I talked about when you and I had a long talk uh, back in March, when I got back from Ottawa representing the truckers, um, uh, my participation in these important cases is funded by the Justice Center for Constitutional Freedoms. Uh, as you know, they're running a tremendous amount of cases on all kinds of things from truckers to doctors and nurses to veterans, uh, teachers, uh, university students, and we could always use uh, funding support. Uh, there's a heavy burn rate, as you can imagine, from what I've just described. At no point, this process was expedited. We filed on January 31st in this Peckford case. There was never a gap. It was like, What's the least number of days to the next step? You know, disclosure of affidavits. What's the next least number of days to cross examinations? No gap. What's the least number of days we could possibly need to cross examine? Oh, six weeks. Okay, they will be scheduled every day for six weeks. And they were. What's the least number of days possible to complete the records and file our factum? We did. In other words, from January to now is as fast as you can do it on a case of this scale and complexity and consequence. So the whole idea that, oh, we can just restart from scratch if the new mandate comes in it, on October 15th is offensive. It's it's bull, uh, I, won't, I won't do it. It's bull crap. They know it's bull crap and they bank on it because it, it's, yeah. like, it's like the constitutional challenges in the states uh, for the election. They, it takes so long to get it to court. They know the next time it happens, they'll do the exact same thing. They'll drop it after nine months and they'll say, oh, come back to court if it happens again. Right now it's moot. It's it's a, it's it's a tactic that you can only do when you're doing it with other people's money and they're doing it with our taxpayer dollars. I'll go further. It's an abusive process. It's an abusive process. It's a it's a, a utilizing a process in a manner to avoid it from being litigated. If they wanted to do this in a more fair and honest and democratic way, they would actually make this rule through the legislature. They would do it through open parliament and they'd say, let's pass the COVID response act, which includes a travel mandate and debate it in open parliament. Right. Um, but no, it's a ministerial order done in the back room or, or anywhere. The minister can literally do it right now, wherever he is. He does. He can I, do it. All. I think, I think they did it on the corners of, of, of napkins after a, a, an evening of drinking and singing Bohemian Rhapsody is how idiotic some of these measures were. Af, no, no, they did it. They did it on that after the mint prime minister was angry because he got booed and heckled. This was, we remember, the evidence is clear that came out when you piece it all together. Remember what he said in French, right? Misogynist, racist, taking up space and do we tolerate these people? And that was his wedge issue. 
The evidence was the emails between the deputy ministers and assisting deputy minister. Where's our rationale? We've got to implement this right away. Uh, Miss Little talking about how is the strictest requirement in the developed world, the conscious decision to exclude compassionate travel as an exemption and all of these things. This was all deliberate and we got to keep fighting for the truth to come out. We got to keep fighting and I'm going to keep fighting and everybody that I'm on my team is going to keep fighting. And I know Premier Peckford's going to keep fighting to ensure that the charter is respected and followed. Phenomenal. Keith, we do it again. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Awesome. I'm going to, I'm going to continue going for a few more minutes. I know I, you had to get out, so I don't want to keep you longer and I'll touch up on some other stories, but Keith, Thank you for everything that you're doing. I mean, yeah, people say you, 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 it's work. And first of all, thank you, because there's not many lawyers doing it. I know the, sh the, the, the crap you're taking because of what you're doing and because of the people for whom you're doing it. Uh, not everybody can deal with it. I'm not sure that I can deal with it. But um, Keith, you are a hero. So keep it up. Peckford's a hero. The people fighting. Maxine Burton, the people fighting for the rights that some Canadians don't even know they need to protect because it doesn't stop here if we don't make it stop here. They'll they'll know by the time it's too late. But uh, Keith, we'll be in touch and uh, you'll come back on and we'll talk about the trucker stuff as there's developments in that. And when there's a decision in this, you'll let me know. Absolutely. And it could be, uh, we don't know, of course, as you know, Eva, that's how it works. They don't, you know, the judge will make her decision when she does. Uh, our calculation is the longer, the more days that go by before the decision comes out, the better it is. Because the easy decision to write is, oh, it's moot, you're done, uh, strike, your claim struck. Uh, the more difficult decision is to, for her consequential decision is to say, no, it needs to go to go to a, a, a full hearing. There's a possibility she'll say, I've actually decided the, the the trial judge, the judge hearing the merits hearing is the one who needs to decide this and punt it up. That recently happened in another case. But uh, I, I my general gut is, and that of the other lawyers, is we'll know within the next 10 10 to 14 days, we'll have a decision and I'll let you know, I'll, I'll email, it, email it to you, make myself available. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Have a good night. All right. I'm going to take my leave. Thank you. Bye now. All right. See you soon.